thank you for uh, having us. So, I have a company called Thinktopia that I started in 2002. Before that, I was wrote Super Bowl spots, and I was in advertising, and worked in Madison Avenue, uh, New York, and uh, encountered some of the Mad Men era, and Mad Men madness, and things like that. Um, but I decided to go out on my own. And uh, we started not as an advertising firm, but, well actually we started as a creative firm, that's where the Thinktopia came from, but we rapidly got into uh, what we now call strategic brand innovation. So I put the list of clients behind me, I know Michael already read off some of them, but I wanted, it will lead me into something else. Uh, we worked with the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation to help uh, high school kids stay in high school. And uh, that effort uh, wound up on Oprah. We worked with the United Nations, on, uh, with the UNEP, uh, United Nations Environmental Programs, um, which is in French, which is why I stutter when I say it. But the, uh, we worked on something called climate change. Uh, we worked with, uh, looking on my list, on the far right there, there's a ball, which you can't see the logo on it, but it's the One World Football Project, which was started by Bono of U2 and some other guys uh, to let refugee kids play soccer instead of wrapping garbage together and heating it up at, uh, in a round form in order to play soccer. Uh, so you can stab it with a bayonet and it will not deflate. It's made out of the same plastic that cl uh, clogs, not clogs, but what are they called? The uh, Crocs, that Crocs are made out of. <laughs> and uh, what else? Time Warner Cable, we worked with uh, them to uh, promote science, technology, engineering, and math for kids, which you may have heard about, uh, because when President Obama, a couple years ago, started talking about it, he was getting all the facts from us, not from Thinktopia, but from Time Warner Cable. They had a $100 million effort put against it, and that, was the, that is the largest uh, uh, private effort placed against that. Uh, Bungie, uh, it might be a name that you're not familiar with, but who here has ever played or heard of Halo, the game? One, <laughs> good, excellent. So Bungie are the makers of Halo, a billion dollar company. But the reason I put these up here is because, um, not because of that, but I have done lots of things in my life, but the, uh, written several Super Bowl spots. I wrote one of the 10 super, top 10 Super Bowl spots of all time according to consumer um, metrics, I guess. And uh, yeah, and if you're in advertising, you know that very few people get to write Super Bowl spots at all. I've written three, and I was doing the math the other day for this and realized that uh, what the Super Bowl just had a 50th anniversary or something like that. I don't even watch the Super Bowl, first of all, except for the ads. But the uh, had their 50th anniversary times at least 50 commercials on there. I think they're more like 100 commercials times uh, all the people. Let's say 10 pe different people who are working on the things. So it came out to like 25 over 25,000 people have worked on Super Bowl spots. So me having written any Super Bowl spots is really insignificant. All right, in the world. Um, I've had book, I wrote a book, and I got a book published. And, you know, they're, they go to the library. Look at all the books at the library, right? So even when we think we've achieved something, it's really just a small little thing in the face of humankind. And when you look at uh, large problems, which is why I went through uh, the Gates Foundation stuff and all that, these are the sustainable development goals uh, given to us by the, that the UN is working on. These are all big problems. No poverty, zero hunger, equality, uh, economic growth, clean energy, life below water, life above water, et cetera. So these are big, huge monster problems. So how do we help solve those problems as individuals? You can't do it, right? because we're all insignificant, small, insignificant, insignificant, hello, insignificant. Are we taping this? <laughs> and we all want to live meaningful lives. We want to leave, lead big lives, right? We want to lead uh, lives where we create impact, have influence, create meaning 
for people in their lives. So how do you do that in the face of really overwhelming odds? And this is the number one parent problem. Excuse me, this is number one problem. Nobody cares. Every time I sat down with a pad and a pen to uh, write anything, I had to make, figure out a way to make people care. Anytime you start a new business, how do you make people care that you're doing what you're doing? That's what we're going to learn today, in the next 30 minutes. So you'll be glad you stayed. So a brand. There are, if you ask 100 people what a brand is, you'll get 100 different answers. Uh, a woman, a uh, master's student at, uh, in New York did this. She asked 100 different designers, uh, creative people, um, leaders in the field what a brand was, and she got 100 different answers, and that was her paper. But a brand is not a logo, it's not an app, it's not a brochure, it's not a Super Bowl spot. A brand is really a community, a community that surrounds you. It's not as important uh, to these days how great your product is, but how great the community that surrounds that product is. There are a lot of great products being made all the time, but they just don't make it. Nine out of ten new products fail, because, not because they're not great, but because there is no community to surround them. So the people building those products, whether it's a new app, a new food product, or whatever, it's, uh, they did not develop or build the community as they were doing that. So when they come out at the other end, two years later, three years later, six weeks later, you, they need that community. They have no one to buy no one to surround them. So brands are communities that are wired together by a common belief system. Brands are belief systems. I started out um, thinking about this because I was working on a problem with Lego. I didn't realize at the, pro at the time, this was 2001, that Lego at that time was going out of, slowly going out of business. They were bleeding to death. Uh, what I ran into, encountered, I was the somewhat the global creative director. What I encountered was that I felt that there was just something out of out of sync. What we today would call uh, being, they weren't authentic. Today would be we would call it authenticity, but back then that we didn't have a word for it. I just had a bad feeling, and so I was thinking about why do we feel something for some people, some places, some things, and not for others. How does that happen? And so I started to think, and I was working in my garden in Connecticut, um, commuted into New York every day on the train, and I was thinking about this, and I started to think about, well, we, we trust them because they have a quality product. And I started thinking about, well, they, we actually trust, we trust them. They have vision on all these kind of thing and values and all that. But we also believe in them in the end, right? So how does that work? And so I started thinking about belief systems. So that's what we're going to learn about today, all right? And we're going to go one step further because we're going to learn, you know, why do these black geometric shapes mean nothing to us really other than the fact that they are square, a triangle, and a circle, whereas these black geometric shapes have great meaning for us, right? We spend millions and billions of dollars on these, especially this one. So brands are belief systems for people. Uh, they surround communities of people, places, and things. Uh, things, uh, people can be anyone from Lady Gaga to Trump. President Trump, uh, to you. Uh, places can be a mall, or it can be Brooklyn, or it can be Little Rock, Arkansas. And things, products and services, or concepts, all right? Brands are belief systems, and beliefs, once we create a belief system, we attract others who share our beliefs. And I'm going to show you how we do that. All belief systems uh, are under this con fall under this construct. Creation stories, creed, icons, rituals, a uh, group of uh, sacred, what we call sacred words or lexicon. Then there are non-believers and, and leader. I'll take you through this one by one. First of all, there's the creation story. We all know that Apple started, or most of us know that Apple started in a garage. Who, who knows that Apple started in a garage? Yay. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a creation story behind the civil rights movement. There's a creation story behind the women's movement. Uh, there's a creation story by Earth about Earth Day that sta started uh, where it was a couple of weeks, what last week, something like that. And even you have your own creation story. And a lot of times when I'm working with people, oftentimes friends, but uh, sometimes celebrities, we go back and we talk about the creation story and how does that line up with the rest of their the values and so forth. Would you please stand? What's your name? Amanda, will you please stand? I only have 27 minutes and 48 seconds left. Yeah. Hi. A smattering of applause for Amanda, please. All right. So, Amanda, where were you born? Pensacola, Florida. Where'd you go to high school? Arkadelphia High School. Where is that? Here? Excellent. There's a joke in there somewhere. Uh, where'd you go to high school? Oh, Arkadelphia. Where'd you go to college? Did you go to college? Sorry. Arkadelphia just had me so thrown that I'm doing all kinds of things. My brain's going crazy, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I, I make up words like Thinktopia, and so my brain just went haywire there for a minute. Where'd you go to college? Okay, cool. And then, where do you live? Cool. Did, and the other question I can't ask HR a lot beyond me. But the, okay, great. Wait. So, given here's a room full of, of strangers, although I know a lot of you know each other. We much feel much better about Amanda right now than we do about anyone else in the room just based on one piece of code, the creation story. Right? Don't we? Smattering of applause for Amanda. <laughs> that wasn't too bad, was it? Good. Once we know where you're from, tell us what you're about. All communities have a set of principles. Uh, this is your vision. This is your um, values, maybe. This is why you get up to go to work in the morning. All belief systems uh, have these principles. It could be think different. It could be just do it. It could be all women are created equal. It could be save the whales, save the bear, the polar bears, save the ice cap, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, we always tend to think of brands as being that external, forward-facing, consumer-facing thing, but there's also a brand internally as well. So I don't know if any of you remember this line from UPS from years ago, but uh, they had a thing called, um, we're the t tightest ship in the shipping business. Does anyone remember that? Oh, some of you do. Um, and that was there because UPS knew that they wanted to become the tightest ship in the shipping business. They wanted to be the global supply chain that it is today. And they knew that they had to get their act together in order to accomplish that. So that saying, that theme, low, theme line, uh, that was in all their advertising was really directed not just to their consumers, to the businesses out there that wanted, they wanted to use them versus FedEx, but it was also to the people inside. And if you remember the tel television spots, which were elegantly produced, uh, it was always of washing the planes and all that kind of stuff. So that mindless task <laughs> of the poor guys who had to wash the planes and clean the trucks and everything w was sort of glorified, but it would, uh, gave the people inside a sense of pride because they were the tightest ship in the shipping business, which really created one of the most tightly engineered, human engineered uh, companies that exist today. The... Um, there's a great story about uh, JFK going to, I think, Cape Canaveral or something like that to see that NASA, and uh, they give the president the tour. They're walking through the facility and everything, and uh, they stop to uh, pause, or they walk through a building, and uh, JFK spots the janitor mopping down at the end of the hallway. And he goes down to, to talk to the guy, and you know his handlers are saying, where are you going, and everything, trying to get him back and everything. But he goes down to talk to the guy, the janitor, and he says, he shakes his hand and everything, and he asks the janitor, what do you do here? And, and the janitor says, Mr. President, I'm sending man to the moon. So how we phrase things, how we frame things is important. And we all have our own creed. After we know where you're from and what you're about, there are icons. Icons 
as Michael mentioned earlier, are about sight, sound. They cover all the senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, and so forth. Um, these are quick concentrations of meaning that identify us from a block away. You can spot someone carrying a Starbucks cup from a block away. You can spot a Volkswagen Be Beetle from two blocks away, right? We all know when people are wearing um, Beats headphones instead of wearing Apple earbuds, right? So icons, some of them, are hardwired into our brains to help us stay safe. So if you are in an alleyway, let's not go there. Let's go to, uh, there are places like a bar. When you walk into a bar or a store or a restaurant and you immediately feel, get me the hell out of here, right? Who's had that feeling? But you're dragged along by a friend or something, right? So you stay until she buys her pair of sh lipstick or something like that, pair of shoes, or until your friend decides that she doesn't like that boy after all and gets out of there or no one's there. So icons ping all, of the, all five of the senses. And a lot of companies, uh, if you remember Abercrombie and Fitch, well, they're not gone yet, but if you remember them <laughs> walking in, <laughs> uh, last time you walked in there, yesterday, uh, that it smell, uh, the smell of walking in, right? <laughs> or the taste of McDonald's french fries, the taste of Starbucks company, coffee, excuse me, the, the um, uh, teddy bears and so forth. Um, so we can identify these things. Uh, back in medieval times, we carried banners so that we could identify the people that we were fighting who were on our side, the people from our town. We go, once we know where you're from, what you're about, and you, we can identify you, and that's very important, now it's how do we act. Icons and rituals go very closely, to, or fit closely together. We came here in a car, which is an icon, but the route that we took is a ritual. Okay, this meeting today is a ritual, and we have certain expectations of how the, those rituals should go. Um, and if you think of the fact that we are bound together by a common belief system and that we are a community, the rituals that we engage in from a community point of view are different than, perhaps than they would be if we look at things from that old pyramid thing of us telling people how, what to expect from us as a product or service. Does that make sense? Anyone? Or is it totally confusing? So we have flipped, the model has flipped, especially within the last three years or so, uh, from a pyramid top-down model where companies would tell us about their products and services, and we would listen as consumers. Uh, the ultimate driving machine, tightest ship in the shipping business, think different uh, about us versus IBM, which was think. In today's world, it's the consumers, the users, point of view that is all important, okay? And that's what builds community. So if we are thinking from the user's point of view, we would not be dragging people's from, people from airlines from their seat, right? If we were thinking from the user's point of view, we would not be talking behind the counter at Starbucks while we have customers waiting, etc. So if you want a positive ritual, get a hug. If you want a negative one, call Comcast. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. Uh, the brand vitality then goes, uh, is a result. Your vitality, your resonance, your relevance comes from the number of repeated positive brand engagements. The number of positive brand engagements, all right? Anyone here in banking? Credit cards, et cetera? <coughs> so it's the, pro the thing we wanna do in all our engagements and what Silicon Valley is and user experience and design thinking that we were, Regina was talking about earlier is all about removing the negative interactions remove all the negative feeling stuff, remove the, um, the barriers, all right? So, rituals. Our smartphones are loaded with rituals. They, our smartphones have replaced rituals. There used to be something called a calendar. 
that was paper, believe it or not, and it had a little metal spiral going through it. And there were families and companies all over the country, if not the world, that depended on people reordering their calendars every year. It was a multi-million dollar business. Gone. Okay, and as well as other things. So Yelp, Tweak, Stream, Snap, and whatever else is coming along next week. Right, downloading, uh, doing your six minute videos on YouTube or Facebook. Shopping is also a ritual. And then there's a lexicon. Uh, all communities have special words that identify those people who are members of the community. Uh, importantly, sometimes they're also to identify people who are not members of the community. If you think in global scale, uh, if you go to France, they have their own language. That community has their own language. But if you go to uh, uh, Silicon Valley or something and you're talking about design thinking or you're a lawyer, doctor, work in marketing versus PR, work uh, in metal prefabrication, we all have our own terms of art. And it's not just the terms of art that uh, vary from company to com or from category to category or industry to industry, it's also the terms of art that we learn inside of companies. Because when, remember the last time you got a, took a new job and they called the kitchen the coffee room or something instead of the kitchen or the pantry. Or, they, um, or it's not just those things, but all the terms of art that are just a little bit different that we use. And the, it's not an office, it's a pod or a workplace or a workspace or open area or whatever it is. But also, it's the jokes and anecdotes that everyone else in the room knows and are laughing about, and you don't, you don't know. And by the way, we do work this, we use this same construct, primal construct, to work with veterans when they come back from Afghanistan or whatever, or out of the military, because they have a whole set, since they were 18 years old, plus or minus a few years, they've had a whole laundry list. They've had the creation story given, handed to them. The creed's been handed to them. They have their own set of icons. They have their, definitely have their own set of rituals of where they're supposed to be in the morning and where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do when they get there. And they have a whole lexicon that is meaningless to the rest of us, and it's usually um, acronyms. A lot of times it's acronyms. And so they have to unlearn all that and relearn what we know, because if they don't know what twerk means and we're laughing, then Chaos. So, so lexicons. And then there's also a group we call non believers. These are the people, I mean, if you remember the Burger Wars, uh, Mac versus Burger King, uh, we laughed about Miller and, and Budweiser and, uh, earlier today because no one drinks them anymore. But the, there were these great competitions Mac versus PC. Everyone knows that Mac won, Apple won. Except the people in IT. I don't get that. <laughs> what, what is that about? Anyway. So, but the great thing about non-believers uh, is not that they're your competition. That's, that's beside the point. But when you can understand really what, who you don't want to be. When, when we have clients who are stuck, and we work with billion-dollar companies a lot of times, so they get pretty stuck. And because they have huge factories, they have people, they have processes, they have methodologies. Uh, processes and methodologies, methodologies, by the way, are synonyms for ritual. The, um, and they get stuck, and they can't move. And so, so one of the things that we do, a trick we do, is we say, well, what are you not? You know, what do you want? What don't you want to become? And some of the things are very obvious, but they get deeper as you go back into it. And we back into who they are and what they think they can be, feel they can be. So it's uh, strategic. Non-believers. Anyone watch Game of Thrones? Okay. The joke's on them, who don't know. Okay, so non-believers. Uh, and then there's the leader. Finally, there's someone who stood up against the world at all odds and against the odds in order to recreate the world according to their own point of view. And these can be, you know, talking about tiny people. Steve Jobs was a high school dropout, right? Also an immigrant or so, 
son of immigrants. Um, Oprah Winfrey was a TV newscaster. For some reason, I flashed that it was in Arkansas. But that, and she, huh? Mississippi, okay. I'm close. The, uh, and she started crying when she was on air because she was talking about a family's home had burned down. And Obama, who's um, uh, just an ordinary guy. Well, as of course, I'm looking, and then I'm looking at George Washington, who was the richest man in the country, so, and Disney, of course. So once we put all these things together, the pieces together, the creation story, the creed, the icons, uh, rituals, sacred words, the uh, non-believers and the leader, we are able to put together a string. And I guess the Game of Thrones thing, now that I remember, is to um, remind me to tell you that it, you can do the same thing, This deconstruct these brands, like Huckleberry Finn or Game of Thrones, which has now become a billion dollar enterprise. Uh, the Sopranos, you can deconstruct it the same way. What's their creation story, their create icons and so forth. Do the same thing with, we did it last week in a Primal Branding Certification course with uh, Lion King, which is a $10 billion brand. Unbelievable, right? $10 billion. Anyway, Primal Code, uh, when you put all these things together, where, you, where you're from, what you're about, how you display yourself, or how we can identify you, whether it's a product or a person or whatever it is, once you string all these things together, that becomes a strategic brand narrative. And I'll go through them a little bit. So just some quick examples. Apple, I think we have established where, they're, where they come from. Uh, the creed, think different. Um, IBM's creed was think, by the way. Uh, Tom Watson had a big think sign uh, uh, behind his desk, which was very intimidating. Uh, the icons, which we can all identify. The Apple logo, Steve Jobs, Tim Cook now, and so forth. The rituals, uh, how we use them and how they've replaced other rituals. Uh, the sacred words, Apple, iPod, iMac, I this, that, and the other thing. And the non-believers, PCs, Android, Comcast. Uh, leader. I had a big fight with Comcast this week. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's go on. Uh, leader, uh, Steve Jobs, and now Tim Case. And the longer th uh, these brands, communities are in existence, the further out these things go. So the creation story for the United States of America or any place, including Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, what's the creation story? How'd you start? Uh, what are we about? Uh, freedom for all, independence, uh, capitalism is in parens there because I was speaking in China, in Beijing, in 2008, just before the Olympics there, and we thought that a great exercise would be to um, uh, talk about China as a brand, right? And so we thought we, we set up the exercise by doing the United States as a brand. And so we start going into it, and I, went, I read Creed, freedom for all, independence, democracy, and everyone is shaking their heads, no. And I went in my best Mandarin, why are you shaking your heads? I had an interpreter. I had an interpreter. Uh, and they, saw, they said, the United States of America is about capitalism. And then I remembered I was in a communist country. And, and I started to pay attention to what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really mean freedom for all. <laughs> so uh, the icons, our icons, not China's, uh, the American flag, the White House Statue of Liberty, et cetera, et cetera. And then the rituals, voting, of course, the 4th of July. I mean, we have both political rituals. We have uh, societal rituals, um, Thanksgiving Day, uh, Martin Luther King Day parade, and so on. Uh, and then sacred words, non-believers, and the leader, of course. Uh, you can do the same thing with movements conceptual, and conceptual things. Um, you can do that with the civil rights movement, the Vietnam anti-Vietnam movement, uh, um, green movement, and so forth. You can do it with personalities, Lady Gaga. Uh, you know, pick a personality. We can do the same thing. And importantly, you can do the same thing for yourself. I have at least three calls a week from a friend who wants to reposition themselves out in the world, or they just um, uh, got right-sized and they are looking for a new position. 
or it's someone who's in college and I'm a mentor to my last uh, mentor, uh, person I mentor. <laughs> um, she's a painter, uh, illustrator, and she, uh, she wanted to get a show. And we, so we went through the whole thing. Okay, what's your creation story? No, it's not about that you're a babysitter. I'm exaggerating. But it, and what is her creed, which is important in the art world, which is what are you all about? Uh, icons, so we didn't change your looks, but uh, nothing like good design. A new dress, you know. And then uh, rituals, uh, and then we went through the whole thing. And who are her... Uh, Anyway, she make a long story short, she got her show, and she also got into Yale Art School last week. Smattering of applause. So you can do it for yourself. Uh, also, other concepts. I mean, gravity, right? It has a creation story. It has a creed. We're not flying off the planet. Uh, <laughs> oh, it has icons, the apple tree, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, and so forth. So, and then Game of Thrones. So you can do this with lots of things. I kind of set myself up there, got ahead of myself. So you could suggest that um, the foundation of our society is built on the fact, based on the fact that two people believe in each other so much that they're willing to commit the rest of their lives together or a little while, and uh, for a little while. So the creation story, how do you guys meet? You know, which always comes up when you're meeting another couple. The creed, I love you back, pookie darling dear. Uh, the ring, the icons, the rings, the flowers, the chocolates, the cards. Anyone want to add to that? The um, rituals, dating, going steady, engagement, marriage, Valentine's Day. And someone once shouted out divorce, uh, which just changed my perception of this slide incredibly. Uh, the sacred, uh, let's see, the non-believers did that. Little years, one or both of you, depending upon who writes the checks, right? So, and then we get to this guy. <laughs> who knows who this is? Do we all still know? Good. Uh, some of us can't remember him or didn't know who he was in the first place, but Cy had, a, you know, one of the greatest hits on YouTube ever. And then what happened? He went nowhere. What? One hit wonder. Yeah. So, so after creating all of that success, uh, he did not fill any of the pieces of code. I mean, I guess we know that he was from Korea, which would be, might, might be his creation story. Icon might, be, might have been the song, Gangnam Style, I think it was. Um, but he didn't do anything else except try to create another hit, uh, which doesn't work. So that opportunity to fill backfill, oh, here's who he is, here's what he's about, et cetera, et cetera, went un, undone. So who here is in PR? Yes, I hope you're paying attention. So this is the construct, this is why we believe in people, places, and things, and even each, sometimes each other. So the desire to belong is at the core of every human being. Being alone or in isolation is a form of punishment, right? And so how we becoming attracted to things um, and belonging to communities, is we're we are hardwired to do that. And so we are connected not only by the digital technologies, we are connected by the hardwires that bring us together as human beings. This is a recreation of a distrib three distribution models. The one on the left, is that the left? Yes, the one on the left is the old centralized model. This is the pyramid, that archetypal pyramid where the person general's on the top and all these foot soldiers are way down below in the chain of command, the whole hierarchy, right? In the 1990s, that became decentralized. So, and in, companies were doing this too. You would have the headquarters centralized in Little Rock, and then it would move to someplace else. Uh, it would be decentralized, and there would be there would be one in Little, all the regions, all the four or five regions around the country would have their own headquarters, right, or their own little mini headquarters. These days, we are in the distributed model, and it's all about networks and 
connected networks at that. Um, how many people are here because you know one of the two people? Brooke, how many here know Brooke personally? Okay, how many people knew to, know to Seth? Keep your hands up. How many people know to Seth personally? Okay, so the rest of you here are, how'd you get here? You're a friend of the friend, right? Yes? Let's just say yes. So <laughs> we will assume that's the case. So it's gone from decentralized, which could be the, uh, you know, broken to Seth, or you're a friend of someone who know them, or a friend of the friend. And so... So the distributed network is incredibly important, and I'm anticipating myself a couple of slides ahead. I'm sorry, but that's become incredibly important. Remember that fact. So what has changed is in the top-down model, after decades of, decades of companies telling us, trying to blindside us and get our attention and pre, uh, create breakthrough advertising that broke through our consciousness and got our, caught our attention, broke through the clutter and caught our attention, uh, after years of that, of pummeling us, thanks to Mad Men, the Mad Men, we are finally tired of it and thank God we don't have to deal with it anymore. We don't really care, okay? So in the new ecosystem, it's what people say about the product or service that really matters. This was always the case. In advertising, we used to say word of mouth is the best form of advertising, but we were really snarky about it because we knew damn well you couldn't evaluate, you couldn't put metrics, you couldn't put numbers against that uh, conversation in the coffee room on Monday morning. You couldn't put numbers against uh, two women talking, you know, outside the school or across the fence. And so we were we could say word of mouth is the best form of advertising, and as it turns out, it is the best form of advertising. It, and the difference is, of course, that today we can put metrics against it by looking at user reviews and so forth. So the great thing is that users do our marketing for us. They do it for free, but we have to find them. We have to find the people who are truly the influencers, et cetera. So in today's world, it's not just the quality of the idea that's going to drive your business. It's going to be the quality of the community that you build around, that you design around that idea. So what you do, the way you do that, is you figure out, you deconstruct your company, your product, your service, whatever you want to do, person, place, or thing, deconstruct it. What's the creation story? What's the creed? What are our icons? What are our rituals? How do we act? How do we behave? What, how do we interact? What's our UX, as Rajne was talking about? Uh, what are, what's the language we use to surround that? What do we not never want to become? Who's the leader? Identify the leader. Because once you can do that, and we do that all the time for companies, it will not only, once you can tell someone, here's where we're from, this is what we're, this is the way, what this product is about, here's the way we're using it, uh, here's the language that we surround it with, here's really what it's not, we don't want to really go there, uh, and here's the team that's leading it, You've just very conversationally kept your product on the shelf at Walmart or Target or wherever you want to be. So this is your new agency. Brands are no longer products or services, but the communities that surround those products and services. The new mission is to create, as Michael so clearly declared before I got up here, is to create a community of people who become so passionate about your success that they create it themselves. What's the biggest example of this to date? Anyone? Was there anyone who had a community of people behind them where they, they, who became so passionate about his success that they created it themselves? Huh? Barack Obama, Donald Trump, both of them, yes? Walmart, where do you work? <laughs> I'm not surprised. She lives in Bentonville. Yes. yes. Excellent. I don't think anyone heard what you just said. She was saying that uh, in Bentonville, people support the community. And it's... 
wow, didn't didn't want to go here, but in in Bentonville, in Bentonville, you can see Walmart supporting the entire community, every aspect of it, and you can see the people supporting Walmart as well. So you know when you're when you're there, you you see this huge interaction between them and the community, and it's very positive. Perfect. Thank you. I, f I feel like Mari Povich. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> That's right. So today we can help drive these uh, deep skin emotional connections uh, via technology, uh, via having our stuff together. And 77%, um, here's the important thing, is that 77% of adults own a smartphone. All right? 100% of people ages 18 to 29 own a cell phone, 92% of them own smartphones. 88, I think it's 88% of millennials get their news off of Facebook. If you're not in mobile, you're dead, okay? So we surround ourselves with this data, with this, these inputs. So the optimum model here is to figure out who your core audience is personally and put yourself on their phones, iPhones or whatever they have, droids or whatever they have, and present yourself in such a way that you are delivering either where you're from, your creation story, what you're about, your vision, values, and purpose, creed, your icons, your clothing, your products or whatever they are, icons, uh, rituals, sale, or whatever the ritual is, or in, whatever your interaction, you want your ideal interaction to be, et cetera, et cetera, what you're not. The companies that do this already, and uh, by the way, no human channel planner, media planner can do this, all right? But computers can, and computers do already. And so that's what AI is all about. And so, There are a couple companies that are doing this already. And uh, naturally, they are Apple, Amazon, maybe Nike. Every day we hear something about Apple, whether it's the new phone, whether it's the old phone, our phone, or the Apple phone against a, uh, uh, the Droid or Galaxy or whatever it is. Uh, it's about Tim Cook or some other personality inside of Apple. It's about Apple TV. It's about Apple cars. It's about the Apple stock price. It's about, but because each piece of information Every data point is different, is, is from someplace else, seemingly random. We don't feel like we're inundated by Apple, and we don't feel like we're inundated by, by Amazon. Although I think that's why their drone is there, so that it can be completely way out there. Why doesn't Walmart have drones? Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> they do have drones. The God help us. And they're coming our way. And the same thing with Nike, but we hear about them every day or, you know, or several times a week anyway, so that we feel that we are still a part of their community. And that's the thing. Does that make sense? So this is out of a great, this quote is out of a great book that I'm reading right now. And I'm only 20 pages into it, but I am circling everything. The, uh, by Derek Thompson called The Hitmakers, content may be king, but distribution is the kingdom. So branding is no longer rhetoric. It's really a, a series of activation points. Um, it's about exercising your vision, your values, your purpose, and your experiences, pulling together all those things together into one unique bundle. And then product, insert a product if you can, or service if you can. So here's a proof point. Uh, some friends of mine and I, I was asked to come in and do the strategy work behind a conservancy in Kenya called uh, Nabosho. And this is a, cons I don't know if you know what a conservancy in Africa is, but if you imagine, because I didn't, uh, if you imagine Yellowstone Park, and then imagine the ranches that are surround Yellowstone Park, uh, what they do is they, so imagine those ranches, those ranches would be the conservancy because what they do with the conservancy in Kenya does is they pay those uh, ranchers, just call them the tribes ranchers for a second, they pay those ranchers to not uh, have their cows there, not grow wheat there, uh, but to let the zebras and the wildebeest roam. 
and and Nabosho, the Namara, by the way, is where we always see the um, wildebeest running along and going through the river and then being chopped up by the crocodile, waiting crocodiles. That's Mara and Nabosho. So we had, um, we wanted to help them. And a friend of mine called me and I said, sure, I'll do the strategy. They had a budget of how much? You think they had a budget for? You're absolutely right. They had zero dollars. So what we did is we put together the code. Uh, a friend of ours did a new logo for them. And uh, someone else helped put together the PR package and everything. And so we did this two and a half years ago. Oh, this is a nice picture of, this is Mara. This is Nabosho. Uh, last year, we got the uh, gold award for uh, ecotourism in Africa from the 57 different countries with all of their budgets and so forth with zero dollars just by doing what I've just described to you. So this is how we move from being meaningless to becoming meaningful and going from people where no place position where nobody cares to where people do actually care. Uh, sometimes they care enough to stand in front of a tank or stand in front of a bullet if you're a nation. And brand, Jeff Bezos says that brand is what people say about you when you leave the room. And it might be that, but I think it's the fact that you can fill a room like this one that really counts. So in today's world, brand communities are as necessary as lungs. That's it.